Hello and welcome. My name is Jan, and today we're going to be doing a brief history of spinning. This is a really huge subject. For example, th this book, Selected Canadian Spinning Wheels in Perspective, an Analytical Approach, is a history of spinning in Canada. It's 350 pages. It's written by Judith Buxton Keenly side, um, and it is an amazing reference on spinning wheels in Canada. However, this is a slice of history and it covers 200 years of one country. So we're going to go over a brief history of hand spinning in a kind of rambling tea and cakes format. I'll be outlining the brief history and just going over some in interesting historical facts that should be interesting to hand spinners and everyone. And some other notes on my sources. There are these uh, items made from dead trees called books, and they're great resources. My, the inspiration for this whole video is actually this book, Spin, Span, Spun by Betty Hochberg. She is an amazing author and an amazing... <coughs> she writes a lot of amazing materials for hand spinners and art historians and everyone. So if you can get a hold of her books, they're Every single one of them is a treasure. Another resource that I've been using is Old Namus' Big Book of Hand Spinning. Another great resource for hand spinners and anyone interested in hand spinning. So, with all that said, bring your cuppa and let's go. Spinning has been practiced by humans for at least 10,000 years. Twisted fiber and evidence of twisted fiber has been found just about everywhere that we find human beings during the spinning of the past 10,000 years. Even the Old Testament, before when it used pictograms for the names of each one of the people in, in the Bible, used the pictograms for Eve as a spindle and Adam as a plow. And thus the authors of the Bible, or the Old Testament, acknowledged the spindle's place in human history. But the evidence of spinning kind of shares qualities with dinosaur feathers. The degradation of the fibers by in history uh, makes it hard to uh, directly find the, the items themselves. And so we say, oh, evidence of. And finding direct evidence, like Otzi the Iceman's woven grass raincoat. He had a raincoat, uh, kind. Of, they think it was kind of like a raincoat, that fit over all of his other fur and animal pelt clothes, but it was clearly woven. So even Copper Age knew the theories behind twisting and weaving fiber. Some other indirect, some, and then when we say indirect evidence, we say things like needles. So there's neat, we found needles made of bone and other things that have very small eyes. So the thread that used to thread them must have been very fine and it must have been spun very fine. There's also imprints on pottery that show very fine textiles and very finely twisted textiles. However, spindles are the backbone of spinning. Oh, not that type of spinning. These types of spinning. So, these spindles are the root of our history of spinning. Wheels were introduced much later, probably about a thousand years ago, and, and were brought from India and China to the rest of the world. We'll delve into those more in the second part. However, we'll go over some tidbits of the prehistory in, these, in the spindle and the rock and spin era of spinning. And we'll start in the Americas. In Danger Cave in the Great Salt Lake Desert, in the Great Salt Desert, a 6,000 year old net pouch of milkweed fibers was found. And in the pre-Columbian Americas, all kinds of fibers were spun, including cotton, yucca, agave, nettles, and animal fibers such as llama, goat, and dog, and anything that they had available, they were spinning. In fact, the Incas saw and revered three llamas in the constellation Lyra. There were two older and one younger, 
lamas, and this was something that they revered as a, a sacred thing. And in reading from Navajo legends, Spider Woman taught the Navajo women how to spin and how to weave on a loom which Spider-Man showed them how to make. The poles, the cross poles were made of earth, and the warp sticks were made of sun rays, and the heddles of rock crystal and sheet lightning. The batten was a sun halo, and white shell was used to make the comb. There were four spindles, one a stick of zigzag lightning with a whorl of cannel coal, one a stick of flash lightning with a whorl of turquoise, a third spindle had a stick of flash lightning with a whorl of abalone. Rain formed the shaft of the fourth spindle, and its whorl was white shell. Now, aren't those just beautiful images? I just love thinking about that. Also, the Mandaruku of South America believe that the creator was dragged into the underworld. They save themselves by making a cotton plant, which they then spun and braided into a rope in which they could escape. Cotton was used pretty widely in by the Aztecs, and small little bits of cotton fabric were used as paper. In the indigenous of southern Mexico, they used wo wooden masks to perfect their skills in spinning and weaving. The masks would be borrowed with separate masks for the different stages of preparation, washers of wool, spinning and weaving. The masks would be loaned by the local brujo, the shaman or medicine man, for 10 days and hung on the wall near those working and would impart a near perfect skill in, the, in what they were doing. Moving across more to Asia. Chinese Empress Si Ling is known as the goddess of silk in China. In 2640 BCE, a silkworm cocoon fell into her warm tea. The warm tea loosened the fibers of the silkworm, and she, re she realized it could be spun and woven into cloth. 2,400 years later, in the Han Dynasty, as this picture is depicting, the Chinese silk was known across Asia and Europe for its fine, elegant qualities, being described as translucent as ice and light as a cloud. Chinese were weaving on draw looms like this one before anyone else and during the Han Dynasty. Also during the Han Dynasty, the 6,000 mile Silk Road was, most, it was open during this time. Stretching from Rome to Shangan, now Xi'an, this route brought silk valued at more than gold to the Middle East and Europe. A Roman emperor denied a request from his wife for, for a single scarf made of purple silk, with the reasoning being it was too expensive. Moving on to the Middle East and Africa. Linen fibers of 540 threads per inch are found in Egyptian mummies. Mummies have informed actually a lot of our knowledge of Egyptian fibers in general, as much as the hieroglyphs have. The hieroglyph kes is a ball of thread with a high whorl spindle. Linen was cultivated in Egypt more than 5,000 years ago, and Isis, the fertility goddess of Egypt, of the, Egypt, of the ancient Egyptians, is believed to have gifted spinning and weaving to her people. She is usually depicted holding a shuttle, and those who worshipped her wore white linen and cotton. Pliny the Elder described cotton cultivation as well as the fine quality of the cotton garments which were produced in his History Naturalis. Moving on into Greek, uh, Greek history, the three fates are Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. Clotho draws life from her distaff. Lachesis spins and winds it on her spindle, and Atropos cuts the thread when your span of life is over. Arachne was a mortal spinner who bested Athena in the challenge of spinning. For her hubris, she was transmorphed into a spider, which gives us the Greek origin for the name of spiders, arachnids. Also, Hercules is credited with the discovery of the murex dye. 
Herc had, Hercules had killed one of his friends and was sentenced by the gods to serve a queen, Omphale, as a spinner. He gave his lion skin to Omphale and wore women's clothes. And when tending his sheep, a uh, flock of sheep for the queen, his sheep dog, his sheep dog bit a seashell, and the purplish red color stained the dog's mouth. And thus, Hercules had had found and passed on the the murex dye. In Rome, the emperor Diocletian set the price of a boxwood spindle at one dozen eggs, meaning that at this time. Spindles were as common as eggs and being used in, by everyone in the same way that everyone eats eggs. Knit wool fragments are found in, are found from Syria dated to even about 200 ACE. The introduction of silk in Europe was roughly 550 ACE when two, vis, when two Persian monks had made a, a pilgrimage to China and had found the secrets of silk making. These two monks presented the Emperor Justinian with two bamboo canes filled with silkworm eggs and mulberry seeds. And since then, the Italian silk industry has been producing fine silks. Moving into the British Isle, a Scot in Scottish lore, a Nordic fairy witch named Geir Kaleen grants luck and knowledge of spinning. You must look for her and, and ask, and if you're lucky, she'll relay her knowledge of spinning to you. But take heed, she'll come to your house on New Year's Eve and inspect your wheel. So you must leave your drive band slack and your bobbin empty. If you leave a half-filled bobbin, she might finish spinning on. She might finish the spinning of your bobbin, but she'll curse you for being lazy. Mother Goose has a great rhyme about spinning. Cross, patch, draw the latch, sit by the fire and spin. Take a cup and drink it up, then call your neighbors in. <laughs> Even Mother Goose knew the daily life of spinning. There was also St. Diffstaff's Day, reading again from Spin, Span, Spun by Miss Betty Hodgeberg. St. Diffstaff's Day was celebrated by spinners in Britain on January 7. This is the day after Twelfth Night when Christmas festivities ended and spinners resumed their work. The farm boys' vacation lasted until the following Monday, so they spent their idle hours teasing the girls by setting their toe flax on fire. The girls threw buckets of water on the flax and on the boys. Herrick describes this in the poem. Partly work and partly play, you must on St. Distaff's day. If the maids a-spinning go, burn the flax and fire the toe. Bring in pails of water then, let the maids be washed the men. Also in the historical record we have the Bayou embroidery. This 230 foot or 70 meter and by about a half foot long span of hand-spun linen with wool embroidery. All of this was hand-spun. And also to think about all of the kings and courts, all of their clothes, this was all hand-spun. Every ship that sailed, fishing nets, ropes, all of the cords, the sails themselves, all were hand-spun. And in this way, the sack of wool has always been a, a link with English nobility. Elizabeth I set this uh, tradition of sitting on sacks of wool to remind all of the nobility how much of their power derived from a humble sack of wool. The spinning wheel actually has a disputed history. Some historians point to different parts of the globe for the origination of the spinning wheel. Indus Valley, Iran, or someplace else. What we know about them is that they were driven spindles and a hand crank wheel. They were usually depicted as being rimless as this example. What we do know is that the idea of spinning wheels became widespread and it arrived over most of the world in Europe by 1300. 
The first flyers that we have evidence for is this wood print in 1480 that depicts a flyer wheel turned by hand. All we know is that they must have been widespread by this time and that foot-powered treadle wheels were still a few, a few hundred years off in the offing. These, these types of machines dominated spinning and became pretty widespread throughout cottage industry and industry itself. T whole towns would need tens of thousands of spinners and weavers to maintain it to not only have clothes but for a lot of the other industrial processes and also transportation shipping and even such things as working in dockyards needed amazing amounts of cordage fiber and um, cloth in the period of 1700 to now the advancements in hand spinning i think could be described as disruptive technology just as disruptive technology in our own age, such as Uber and these transportation networking companies have caused, has, have caused different changes for taxis and transportation in our cities, disruption in the, in the, 17, in the early industrial uh, age shows the fallout for regular people and hand spinners during that time. For example, think of the cotton gin. With the ability to automate the processing of cotton, the export of cotton grew exponentially. And with this, the need for more field laborers, field laborers to grow and harvest the cotton. Slavery provided this labor and, labor, and these economics of King Cotton have played a role in the southern United States ever since then. As steam powered provided automation for looms, the automation of spinning and fiber preparation continued. Automating wool processing as well as the spinning of yarn put many spinners out of work. These tens of thousands of people who were needed, were needed in cities were put out of work. And with the powered looms and automated processing, these factories could replace the output of these tens of thousands of workers. However, it was later, much later on that flax for linen could be spun at indus by industrial mills at industrial scales. The redding and hackling of flax could be easily done on an industrial scale, but the spinning was still done by hand until machines could. This was in the Victorian age. Queen Victoria herself promoted and owned several spinning wheels to promote the cottage industry of spinning flax and to promote spinning to the public. Spinning competitions in the United States were, were very popular until the First World War. Flax was usually the fiber being spun. Another famous hand spinner was Gandhi. He was a shameless promoter of the practice. Mahatma Gandhi on spinning. For me, nothing in the political world is more important than the spinning wheel. Gandhi's loincloth, cloth, shawls and towels, and bed sheets were all homespun, and he would spin at least half an hour each day, and he called spinning a sacrament which helped turn the spinner's mind Godward. Gandhi made several tours of India collecting money to buy spinning wheels for peasants, to open stores for the sale of homespun, and to, tra to train new spinners. There is a long association with flax and cotton being higher class than the lower class wool and animal fibers. Egyptian hieroglyphs, as well as the Bible passages in Leviticus, warn us not to mix fibers of animal with plant-based ones. Western European cultures also took up this practice and until roughly the 1950s when different treatments and all kinds of chemistry really evened out the class uh, the class thinking of each one of the different fibers part the third why spin today in an age of industrialization and cheap products sheep shipped from across the globe why would you choose to make yarn yarn is a very standardized product you can buy it according to iso standards and why not just go to a local yarn shop and 
buy what you need. My answer to that is multifaceted. And I could go on for an entire video of this for this answer by itself and several videos about this by itself. My first answer to that is yarn from a mill tries in every way to imitate hand spun. Hand spinners of the past would not recognize the fiber that most garments are made of. The fiber that you can produce yourself for your purpose will have the characteristics that you build it to have. Spinning for your own projects is not only a great challenge and, and will, it will produce a better finished fine product than any mill and it's also a great practice. It can give you infinitely more choice of construction than that you, you can buy. You can spin wool that will feel softer than silk. You can blend fibers for spinning or preparation that for strength, luster, softness, color, density, or any other number of characteristics that you wish to have. Wool is a supremely awesome fiber to spin with. And most people think, oh, wool is scratchy, but you can surprise them the amount of different types of feel that a finished wool garment can have. Other animal fibers, as well as plant fibers, are just as surprising to what a finished piece can be in what, what is difference from expectation. Another example being this absolutely incredibly soft linen baby sheet that was given to me by my grandmother from Holland. And I cannot describe how soft this is. And most people say, oh, linen is hard and scratchy. And this is a baby sheet and it is baby soft. Handmade items are autumn, have so much more chi and character with their own imperfections and little happy accidents, like Bob Ross says, hand spinning is an art. It takes time and practice to get great at it, but the, the result f is both a practical item that it's yarn and both as an art item, as something that you can appreciate for all of its happy accidents you'll find that is well worth the effort every single time. The act of spinning itself is a calming meditative practice when you get practiced with it. It goes great with music or a movie in the background. You can just feel this, it's very rhythmic and, the, and once you get into this rhythm of it, you can I, I've been spinning for hours and it just feels literally like minutes because the, everything is just this rhythmic, very meditative action. It's a great way to catch up with friends. It's a great way to hang out in a knitting circle or a, you know, stitch and bitch as it were. And guilds and other spinning groups are a great way to not only improve your skills as a spinner, but meet other amazing people and other amazing artists and artisans. Spinning is a great way to connect with culture. If you learn how to spin in a traditional manner of a culture, you will learn more about that culture than any, than just about any other act that you could do than any other book or any other YouTube video. This knowledge and this knowledge combined with action will connect you with the past, the present, and also the future in, in a way that I, I can't describe and it is so amazing to feel. And the act itself is just 
mesmerizing. It's almost like watching a plume of smoke in reverse, just this yarn being created from this un, you know, tangled mass of fiber. This drafting twists the yarn into being. This magic in your hands is just as rewarding as a finished skein of yarn that meets your needs precisely. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for watching and I hope you guys all had fun. And before I close out for hand spinners, I have one more little fact about S and Z twist. Most yarn is spun with a it is spun clockwise with a Z twist. There are a lot of superstitions in many different cultures about yarn spun anti-clockwise or with an S twist. S twist yarn has been widely used by shamans, sorcerers, and other mystic people for medicinal, ritual, and magic uses. S twist yarn is said to be effective against rheumatism and difficult pregnancies. Among some Peruvian Indians, an enemy could be easily dispatched in the following manner. A piece of black, of black wool and a piece of white wool are spun with an S-twist. They are tied into a noose and laid in the path where the enemy will pass. Sickness or death of your enemy will result. Many people traveling in southern Me in Mexico, Central America, and Peru wear a piece of S-twist yarn around their necks or wrists as a charm to ward off accidents. Many that Betty Hotchberg saw were dyed red or brown. S-twist yarns were often used as love charms. An Indian girl when weaving will slip a small length of S-twist yarn into her weaving. Then she will give the garment to the man that she wishes to have fall in love with her. Once he has worn the clothing, he will be in love with her forever. So with that, we're going to close out this short, brief video on the history of spinning. I hope you guys had fun and I hope you guys had a great time. I certainly had a great time sharing a lot of the, sharing many of the different tidbits. So if you have any of your own tidbits, please leave them in the comments and keep on treadling.